Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for being here. I think in a strange, maybe silly way, it still feels like this takes courage. I mean, um, this is the first event that we've had on campus post-COVID in which we're not in a socially distanced space in which uh, we are doing uh, a live communities in conversation event sort of the way it was pre-COVID. And um, I know that there are lots of people who are uh, going to be watching tonight uh, on live stream, and that is absolutely fabulous, but I do believe there is a kind of aura, a presence of being here and being directly in conversation, looking into the eyes of a community that makes this a different kind of experience. So thank you very much. My name's Jonathan Judakin. I'm the curator of the Communities and Conversation events here at Rhodes College. And the conversation that we're gonna be having tonight really began in the fall of 2019 when we had Ibram X. Kendi on campus uh, to talk about how to be an anti-racist. For those of you um, who were there or who know about Kendi's book um, or have been influenced by some of that thinking, you know that he is largely coming from the perspective of someone speaking about uh, issues focused on anti-black uh, racism primarily. And this event was originally scheduled in the spring semester to follow in order to deepen and broaden that conversation. And I remember texting back and forth um, in the course of that time period saying, no, I think everything's gonna still fly. Nope, we're shut down. Like, um, and that was March of 2020. Um, and tonight we have the opportunity to finally realize something that really it has been uh, years in the making. Um, in full, we hosted Tressie McMillan Cottom and there were, you know, more than 100 of us who were in uh, McNeil, but that's a big room, seats 600 people. We were far apart um, from one another. It was a really great conversation, but tonight feels special because it's a little closer to the old uh, normal where we can have a more intimate um, conversation. And I'm hoping that tonight will really be just that, a deep and intimate conversation about how to fight anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I want to remind you, because it may seem like long ago, of what the context was when we first began planning this um, in 2019 or so. The Trump presidency would, was at its height at the time, and the Trump presidency was only one of many uh, uh, that were part of a global resurgence of the authoritarian and populist right uh, that was rising globally, a right that historically was defined by anti-Semitism, but that now has, is often pro-Israel, and today defined um, much more by their Islamophobia. Remember that one of Trump's first policies when he came into office was the Muslim ban. Those issues then are still very relevant um, Today, in France, uh, it, there's going to be a presidential election in, in just a few days. Um, this is a, an, academic, uh, an area of academic interest to uh, our speakers tonight. And the whole debate in the French context has been defined by the right, focused on issues of immigration, security, and Islam, but also quite a bit on anti-Semitism when to name it as such, and what the role of the state uh, is and, and, uh, and state institutions are in fighting it, issues that are roiling European politics um, in the last decade. Um, so tonight's conversation was planned um, as, as part of um, internal conversations within the Jewish, Islamic, and Middle East Studies program. It's presented by uh, Jimes, 
here at Rhodes, the Jewish, Islamic, and Middle East Studies uh, program, and it's intended partly to highlight that program, and it is going to feature a number of Rhodes faculty teaching in that program. If you aren't familiar already with JIMES, I want to tell you that um, it is a unique program. There is no other liberal arts college in the United States that has a program quite like it, since it is a program that refuses to segregate Middle East and Islamic studies and Jewish studies. JIMES houses three different minors, a Jewish studies minor, a Middle, an Islamic and Middle East studies minor, and a mixed minor. And regardless of which track that you study, if you take five uh, um, JIMES courses in one of those three tracks, if you're studying Jewish studies, you are going to study at least one course in Islamic and Middle East studies, Islamic and Middle East studies at least one course in Jewish studies, and then of course there's the mixed minor, the, the mixed minor and that's because we believe you can't really fully understand the one without access to some uh, deep knowledge and, and focused learning about the other. Um, I want to uh, let you know that one of the JIMES professors, Essen Kirdish, uh, who is the current chair and, and one of the founders of the program uh, tonight and who really is one of my uh, favorite colleagues on campus, a wonderful professor in um, international studies, is one of the JIMES professors uh, who you aren't going to be tonight, and that is uh, too bad. I love uh, Dr. Kirdish, and she, uh, partly because she really like makes all the heavy lifting involved with JIMES just look so easy, as she does with so many other things on campus. So, um, thank you. Um, I also want to uh, do a shout out to Eti Terim, uh, the other co-founder along with me of the JIMES program, uh, who is not here tonight because she's on uh, sabbatical. I want to let you know that um, we intentionally chose to do this program at this point on the calendar. We know that uh, Ramadan has begun. Uh, in fact, there may be some students who are here or who are watching the live stream uh, who will uh, be breaking their fast after uh, this program. Uh, this is a week before Passover and, of course, also um, the Easter break. We also chose to do the event um, at this point on the calendar um, because this is when um, search courses, and I know because I've seen a number of my own uh, students from search, search courses um, have also begun or just uh, finishing uh, the, set, the unit of that course that uh, focuses on the reading of the Quran and perhaps in those courses uh, you have discussed something about the history of Christian anti-Judaism and uh, for all those reasons um, it, it's very relevant to what you're doing in search right now. I also want to let you know that tonight would not have been possible without support from search and its chair uh, Judy Haas who has really been a stalwart leader of that program in a difficult time and who has been an unfailing supporter of the communities and conversation um, conversations that have tried to emphasize anti-racism as a central value for students in search. Tonight's also made possible by um, uh, support from the history department, support from uh, Chaplain Beatrix who's here with us, from uh, Hillel's of Memphis, uh, and the Student Muslim Association. I also want to um, signal the, the um, support and help I got from Shanti Smith and Kevin Collier for helping to restore this very beautiful space, Hardy Auditorium, um, back to the way that you're experiencing it tonight because this was like in an emergency converted into a classroom and looked very different um, before tonight. Um, and a lot of work had to go into like turning it back into this space. And we are hoping actually, because this room is such a gem on the Rhodes campus, that we will really be turning it into a fully usable and modern um, event space, um, which it is not right now. This is the, the opposite of a smart um, 
space, but it's an antique gem, and I thank them very much um, for helping restore it to its beauty. And also to thank uh, Maya Robertson, Isabella Tablan, and Brittany Ashley, who make up the um, Communities and Conversations team who put a lot of work into tonight. So that's all my thank yous. You'll be happy to know. Uh, I'm also not going to take much time in uh, reading through the CVs of Dr. Ethan Katz and Professor Menhaz Afridi. These are, I can assure you, two of the leading scholars in the nation when it comes to dealing with issues facing Muslims and Jews and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. That is why we invited them. Um, Dr. Katz is a professor of history at University of California, Berkeley. He is most well known in the academy for his award-winning book, The Burdens of Brotherhood, Jews and Muslims from North Africa to France. He is a terrifically prolific and wonderfully erudite scholar who has done much else uh, besides his scholarship including co-founding and co-directing the anti-Semitism education initiative at Berkeley and as part of that initiative producing an excellent short introduction to anti-Semitism that I suggest you Google or go to his web page and, and I bet you will find a link to it if you want a short and compelling take on what college students need to know about anti-Semitism, something he'll no doubt be informing you more about tonight. Professor Afridi, likewise, is an amazing scholar with an eclectic and diverse background who teaches at Manhattan College in New York. She is trained in Islamic studies from the perspective of literature and religion. She is most well known in the academy as the author of Shoah, through Muslim eyes. If you aren't familiar with the word Shoah, it is a Hebrew word for destruction or catastrophe, and it's used by scholars of the Holocaust to point to its singularity. So you might want to hear Holocaust through Muslim eyes when I tell you the title of her book, and her title alone makes clear that she bucks conventions by forcing us to rethink what we think we already know. She is director of the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Relations Center at Manhattan College. Now, rather than give you a long list of all their books and their academic accomplishments and accolades, let me just tell you how tonight is gonna roll. Uh, we are gonna start with short talks from Dr. Katz and Professor Afridi. They will then respond to one another's um, um, talks uh, 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 for a short while, and then three Rhodes professors who teach in the Jewish, Islamic, and Middle East Studies uh, program will come on stage, they will introduce themselves to you if you don't know them, and they will ask one follow-up question, and then we're going to open it up to you for questions. We will wrap up at 7.30. And I really ask all of you, please, I see lots of students hovered towards the back door. I ask all of you that you stay with us until 7.30 tonight, because although this room is a wonderful gem on campus, it's noisy when people get up and move around, and it will disrupt the conversation, as will your phones. So if you haven't already silenced them, please put them away. With that as a caveat, Let's learn more about how to fight anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Thank you. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Uh, thank you so much to uh, Jonathan Judakin, uh, who I sometimes call my brother by another mother, uh, longtime collaborator and friend. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and it's also a great pleasure to share the dais with my friend Manaz. Uh, we met at a conference almost 10 years ago, and we were kind of instant uh, friends, and it's been a lasting friendship, and we've looked for opportunities to collaborate. And finally, uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for that. So it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm going to focus um, most of my remarks 
on anti-Semitism, but I am partly going to emphasize the way that historically and at present, it is very difficult to talk about anti-Semitism, as Jonathan already observed, without also talking about other forms of exclusion, including Islamophobia, and the complex interconnections between these forms of hatred and exclusion. So first, I'm going to discuss briefly how anti-Semitism became inseparable from colonialism and Islamophobia in the context of the rise of European empires. Then I will describe an important counter-tradition of anti-racist activism shaped by the Holocaust and the movements that overthrew Europe's colonial empires in the decades after World War II. Finally, I will talk about how today's anti-racism takes a different approach and argue that if it is to address seriously both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, it must focus more on interconnections between the two, drawing upon tools from this older tradition of anti-racism. Historically, ideas about Jews and Muslims were long closely connected in the European imagination. The late 19th century witnessed the rise of mass politics, and this coincided in important ways with the rise of European colonial empires. Britain, France, and other European powers were touting democracy, equality, and notions of the public good while also conquering large parts of the globe. Large numbers of Europeans were settling many territories and expropriating land, gaining social control, and monopolizing local politics. Many of these territories housed large populations of Muslims and, to a lesser extent, Jews. Now, in order for Europeans to resolve the tensions between liberty at home and subjugation overseas, three elements were necessary. First, institutionalized racial hierarchies that defended the superiority of European civilization and the inferiority and backwardness of the native peoples. Two, practices of divide and rule that pitted some segments of the local population against others. And three, a rhetoric of emancipation that spoke constantly of an eventual equality for the native peoples that always remained on the horizon but never realized. One of the largest colonial empires in the world, that of France, exemplified these practices and their impact upon Jews, especially in French North Africa. By the mid-20th century, this region was home to some half a million Jews who lived alongside a much larger Muslim-majority population. In French Algeria, in particular, Jews found themselves pitted against Muslims. Jews were granted citizenship en masse in Algeria in 1870, even as for their Muslim neighbors, the promise of assimilation remained just that, a promise unfulfilled frequently invoked rhetorically, but absent from real life. And here we come to the paradoxical relationship of anti-Semitism and colonialism. Many racial anti-Semites saw Jews and Muslims as racially linked, fellow Semites, both racial others, with much in common, but also the pre ever-present danger of fratricidal conflict between them. At the same time, a number of major French writers created a stock character, the Jewish colonial conspirator, who was blamed for imperial overreach and its threatening backwash to the mainland. Such images featured in contemporaneous British anti-Semitism as well. The fallout from the 1870 Act, the so-called Crémieux Decree, that granted Jews equal citizenship in Algeria, reflected the contradictory modes of anti-Semitism in the colonial context. The Emancipation Decree for Jews in French Algeria was pushed through by the French Minister of Justice, a Jewish devotee of the French Republic, named Adolf Crémieux. That's why it was called the Crémieux Decree. And on the one hand, leading anti-Semites blamed this decree for an anti-French uprising led by Muslim sheikhs that broke out the following year. With no evidence, they saw endemic Muslim Jewish hatred as the cause of this revolt. The same view of Jews as fellow racial others animated the fierce opposition to Jewish citizenship among the large French settler population in Algeria and made anti-Semitism a hallmark of local politics in Algeria's major cities for the next 80 years. They reasoned that if this one small group of non-Christian, non-white natives could become equal French citizens, then so too could the Muslims. And if the Muslim majority attained full rights, then that would entirely upend the racial hierarchy and structural inequalities necessary to the power exercised by the colonists. At the same time, though, Adolf Kremio was treated as the embodiment of the Jewish colonial conspirator. He was alleged to have worked only for the sake of his fellow Jews across the Mediterranean, in careful coordination with him, knowing they said, that this would foment revolt among Muslims. Here we see already how codependent ideas about Jews very often were with those about Muslims. On the one hand, alleged racial proximity to Muslims helped to racialize Jews. On the other hand, a kind of Islamophilia was articulated to contrast Jews as the, quote, bad Semites with Muslims as the allegedly, quote, good ones. We can also begin to get a sense of how France's North African holdings, especially Algeria, 
were the setting both for utopian fantasies of a traditionalist hierarchical society that would restore the glory of European civilization and for dystopian nightmares about Jewish imperial power. What colonialism and the juxtaposition of Jews and Muslims did for anti-Semitism was to knit together a number of the key ideas of anti-Semites that could have otherwise seemed contradictory. In the colonial schema, Jews were racially inferior like their fellow colonial natives and economically powerful over the same natives. They were seen as conspiring in international concert with clan and kin and acting as political puppeteers, exercising control over the nation's interests. And this remained the case through the 1930s when the Great Depression and the rise of fascism brought a resurgence of anti-Semitism in mainland France and Algeria. Now, in the wake of the Holocaust, the racialized rhetoric and practices that linked colonialism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia found their mirror image in the emergence of a counter-tradition of resistance, wherein many Jews, Muslims, and other oppressed groups locked arms against colonial powers and their exclusionary norms. The most striking case of this was Albert Memmi, a Tunisian-born French Jewish philosopher. Memmi's 1957 treatise, The Colonizer and the Colonized, became an instant classic of anti-colonial movements. And me then went on to write at length about other groups that faced discrimination and sought liberation, blacks, the working class, women, and especially Jews. And me took a personal interest in some of these struggles. He was someone who had himself lived experiences of anti-Semitism, poverty, and colonial oppression. This made him acutely aware of multiple systems of oppression. He eventually sought to analyze them together in his 1968 work, Dominated Man. There, he not only compared the experiences of Jews, women, domestics, working class, the colonized, and others, but also pointed to certain structural mechanisms and systems of thought that linked multiple types of oppression. In hindsight, we can see clearly that he was pioneering a form of analysis that we today call intersectionality. The great difference between Mimi's early work and today's conversation about intersectionality, and I'll say more about this in a moment, is that Jews were front and center for Mimi, rather than absent as they often are today. Mimi explained this clearly in his 1966 book, The Liberation of the Jew, where he laid out his view of the Jewish condition as follows, quote, The Jew was and basically remains an oppressed person, the object of constant potential threat anywhere in the world. Like all oppressed people, they have the right to a specific liberation. The liberation of peoples, Jews included, has assumed the form of national and social liberation. Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, and the state of Israel is the culmination of Zionism. All their courses of action are ultimately nothing but accommodations with oppression. Strange as this view may sound to some of our ears, it was at the time hardly exclusive to Mimi. A whole generation of post-war critics of colonialism and racism, including Franz Fanon, Hannah Arendt, Aimé Césaire, and Jean-Paul Sartre, saw the Jewish condition as inseparable from the condition of other oppressed peoples. Fanon, the famous anti-colonial theorist from the French Caribbean, wrote in one of his classic works, Black Skin, White Masks, about the significance for him of the Holocaust. Far from Europe, in his native Martinique, Fanon's teacher told him, quote, whenever you hear anyone abuse the Jews, pay attention because he's talking about you. Fanon wrote, later I realized that he meant quite simply that an anti-Semite is inevitably anti-Negro. This is just a tiny sampling of a veritable cascade of thinkers in this era that spoke in multi-directional ways about anti-Semitism, colonialism, racism, Islamophobia, and other exclusionary isms. Today, this tradition lies largely forgotten. A good summation of the way that Jews and Muslims tend to see one another in their struggles against oppression comes from the famous Israeli writer Amos Oz in his wonderful memoir, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Quote, often the persecuted and the oppressed each sees in the other not a partner in misfortune, but in fact the image of their own common oppression. Arabs, says Oz, see Israeli Jews not as, quote, a bunch of half hysterical survivors, but a new offshoot of Europe with its colonialism, technical sophistication, and exploitation that has cleverly returned to the Middle East. While Israelis see Arabs not as, quote, fellow victims, but as, quote, pogrom-making Cossacks, bloodthirsting anti-Semites, Nazis in disguise, as if our European persecutors have reappeared here in the land of Israel, put keffiyehs on their heads and grown mustaches, but they are still our old murderers interested only in slitting Jews' throats for fun. In contemporary Europe and America, more often than not, I would argue, the same statements would be equally true if we substituted Jew for Israeli and Muslim for Arab. But must this be so? We are living in an era that has witnessed a new rise of anti-racism and a public sphere that crackles once more with discussion about various inequities and exclusions. And yet the place of Jews is profoundly different than it was in the post-war counter-tradition that I just described. 
Jews occupy a complex and fraught position in America's racial landscape. And yet that complexity is more often than not occluded by the racial binaries that dominate so much of our national discourse. The status of Jews is no longer widely seen as aligned with that of blacks, Muslims, Hispanics, and other historically disadvantaged groups. Rather, the latter are viewed as people of color, and Jews' position is frequently perceived as simply white and privileged. Now, this depiction ignores Jews' ethnic distinctiveness, long history of racialized persecution, and diversity. The conflict over Israel-Palestine is seen in similarly binary terms. Zionism is now frequently portrayed as simply a white supremacist settler colonial movement of oppression synonymous with conquest and racism. Palestinians are understood by many on the activist anti-racism wing of our politics as an oppressed minority experiencing their own version of Jim Crow in the Middle East. Together, these highly problematic depictions of Jews in America and Jewish nationhood in Israel-Palestine have had enormous consequences for the wider awareness and concern about anti-Semitism and its relationship to other hatreds. I would argue that such a narrow view has led us to forget not only that Jews struggled together for decades against oppression alongside other marginalized groups, but that Jewish history fundamentally is a history conditioned by anti-Semitism. And this double erasure essentializes and distorts images of Jews today. The binaries into which Jews are too often lumped as essentially white and powerful also obscure crucial, crucial convergences, parallels, and distinctions today between anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other hatreds. And I'm just going to mention two quickly in the time that I have left. For the resurgent far-right white nationalist movement in contemporary America, Jews and Muslims are not white. In fact, they are leading a racial war that is depicted as a a case of so-called white genocide or white replacement. And this reminds us that while historically both Jews and Muslims have sometimes been considered white in America, that whiteness where it has existed has always been contingent and conditional. Secondly, something else that anti-Semitism and Islamophobic bigotry share is that these hatreds frequently take the form of vehement opposition to international political actors, entities, or movements that morphs into hatred against fellow Americans and that questions in some manner whether they share the values and principles of American democracy. So in the case of Muslims, it often is an equation of all Muslims with terrorists or with ISIS or with the Taliban and an expectation that all Muslims should condemn every act of these groups commit or else it must mean that they condone them. We can also find parallels with the way that opposition to Chinese policy can lead to acts of anti-AAPI racism. For Jews, a major and growing form of anti-Semitism in America, which we witnessed all too vividly during the last Gaza war, is the equation of opposition to Israeli policy or to Zionism with hostility toward Jews that people see around them. If in the case of Muslim and Asian Americans, I think we are often clear that this is an unacceptable form of racism, we need to be able to be equally clear about it when it applies to Jews. Now part of our challenge is that we are still struggling to speak to the complex position of Jews, both racially in contemporary America and of Zionists in Israel-Palestine. White presenting Jews in America are effectively what Michael Rothberg calls implicated subjects, and that they are neither the greatest victims of American racism nor typically its primary perpetrators. Rather, they are implicated in systems of injustice that they benefit from, both with regard to historical legacies and contemporary structures. At the same time, theirs is what Rothberg calls a complex implication, since American Jews simultaneously continue to be victims of anti-Semitism. Zionism, meanwhile, has a dual significance historically and at present. Since its conquest of significant land in the 1967 Six-Day War and the occupation that followed, Israel has been an indisputably colonial entity. Simultaneously, it remains the product of a legitimate national liberation struggle on the part of a historically oppressed minority. Holding up both sides of these dualities is not easy, but it is crucial. And here again, we can look for tools in that post-war generation of anti-racist activists, in particular, Albert Memmi. In the introduction to the English language edition of his book, The Colonizer and the Colonized, Memmi tackles similar dualities in his own life directly. Quote, here is a confession I have never made before. I know the colonizer from the inside, almost as well as I know the colonized. Like all other Tunisians, I was treated as a second-class citizen, deprived of political rights, refused admission to most civil service departments, etc. But I was not a Muslim. The Jewish population identified as much with the colonizers as with the colonized. They were undeniably natives, as they were then called. However, unlike the Muslims, to them the West was the paragon of all civilization, all culture. 
When anti-Semites today claim that Zionism simply is colonialism, they return us to the image of the Jewish colonialist that I mentioned at the outset. And they forget the complex history of Jews and other racially persecuted groups and their interconnections. Likewise, when Jewish activists conclude that the fight for minority rights or religious tolerance or protections for immigrants is no longer a fight that concerns Jews, they obscure from view the intersectional nature of anti-Semitism, colonialism, Islamophobia, and other exclusionary ideologies. In sum, it is essential that we recall a history wherein anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other hatreds were fundamentally linked, and a counter-tradition of resistance in which Jews saw themselves and were seen as fighting alongside other groups with histories of oppression and marginalization. For non-Jews seeking to combat hate, and for Jews themselves, recovering these interconnections is imperative both to understanding the present and to finding a way forward. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom to everyone. Um, I just want to thank Jonathan Judeikin so much for having me here after so long and waiting. Um, also, I, I'm just so pleased to share the stage with Ethan, who I have known for, what, I think 10 years or more. Uh, we've been trying to do work together, and I'm glad that we're here on the stage, and I really want to thank the Jewish Islamic and Middle Eastern uh, program here, which sounds pr really amazing. And I really want to commend you uh, for putting your minds together and your resources together for something that was wonderful. So Ethan's a hard act to follow, but my, my talk is a little different. And I'm hoping um, to shed light on Islamophobia, but also to share some personal nuances of what it means to live as a Muslim woman in America. In late January 2017, I was driving my eight-year-old daughter to school when she said in a quiet and sad voice, Mama, I'm worried that they will take you away. I looked at her stunned and asked, what are you talking about? She said to me in an irritating way, you mean you didn't hear that they're banning Muslims, especially immigrants from the US? And Mama, don't you understand you are one of them? I did not know what to say, but stroked her dark long hair and comforted her by telling her that I had been a citizen since 2009 and they could not legally take me away. She should not fear, I told her, because the American people would never let this happen. I went on to say that I chose to live here because of religious freedom. She still looked worried. As we came to a stop at her school, the car doors swung open, and I watched her disappear into the corridors of a private Catholic school in Riverdale, New York. My heart sank. I never wanted my children to feel othered like I did when I was a young child growing up in Europe. On Friday, January 27, 2017, President Donald Trump signed an executive order that banned foreign nationalists from seven predominantly Muslim countries from visiting the country for 90 days, suspended entry to the country of all Syrian refugees indefinitely, and prohibited any other refugees from coming into the country for 120 days. This became the Muslim ban. I begin this presentation with a personal and heartbreaking story about my daughter to illustrate the deep and impactful feeling that many Muslim American children felt during that period. My daughter was born in Long Beach, California to her white American Muslim father and her brown Pakistani Muslim mother. And all of a sudden, she was othered and rejected by a country that had been her father since the 1700s and her mother's more recently. This became an important story to me, not just personally, but intellectually, as I am a professor of Islam and the Holocaust. And I've been teaching about Islamophobia since before 9-11 as a graduate student. And I've also been teaching the Holocaust and Judaism since 2000. My classes on Islam are more challenging to teach, especially as I read my evaluations, comments such as, she is lying, Muslims are indeed terrorists. Why is she hiding that Muslims are extremists? They're definitely oppressed women, don't they? 
isn't Islam a fake religion? But then I get lucky at times and, and witness how some students transform and feel like they have been misled by the media, their families, and community. Unfortunately, Islamophobia is defined as a fear of Muslims. In my book, Shoah Through Muslim Eyes, which Jonathan mentioned, I use the term anti-Muslim sentiment because phobia to me connotates a meaning that makes me cringe at the thought that we Muslims are seen as fearful, as if we embody something that creates an immediate aversion or fear, a physical disease perhaps. Or as Sandra Gilman, one of my mentors would say, racism is a pathology. When he gave a lecture at Manhattan College recently, he even asked the question, is anti-Semitism a mental illness? May I dare to ask the same question of anti-Muslim hate? I want to make brief, brief three points today, but this topic is a difficult one. One that has been a concern for both Muslim and Jewish community in Europe and the United States. The topic has to be nuanced and understood in various ways. One that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is a historic problem beginning with the advent of Islam Christianity for, for Jews, and its relationship with colonialism and Christianity. Two, that Edward Said's definition and description of Orientalism still holds very true, and is factually relevant in many ways in how we stereotype, perceive, and are phobic of Muslims and racialize them. Three, how to offer some thoughts to combat Islamophobia. And finally, how anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are related to these comments. I'm afraid that Jonathan has entrusted me and Ethan with a huge task of how to combat something that most of us perhaps do not even understand or have a historical understanding of, but I imagine we'll try our best. I would argue that in the 1920 centuries, the ideology of racism was used as a ruling device by imperialist powers, thereby leg leg legitimizing their actions despite the obvious contradiction to supposedly universal enlightenment values of rights and equality. Race thinking was transformed into racism by the context of imperialism, becoming ideolog ideologized as a systematic worldview, politicized as the organizing principle of politics, and biologized with scientific or pseudoscientific theories to generate a justification for imperialism. This racism was distinctly uh, distinctively systematic. The major ideological pivot of colonial ideology, which functioned by reducing the colonial subject to the status of subhuman, a la Jean-Paul Sartre, and the embodiment of superfluity. The portrayal of this irredactable and fundamental racial and cultural superiority of European colonizers over native subjects filtered into the mainstream imperialist consciousness thus convincing the colonizer of his innate capacity to rule and dominate, as Hannah Arendt would say. In the United States, American Muslims of the 1700s and 1800s served as slaves with other Africans, but it was noted that there was no actual Muslim presence, and this presence was not to be expected in the United States. However, Cotton Mather was a New England Puritan clergyman and a prolific writer, educated at Harvard College, joined his father and became a minister of the Congregationalist Old North Church of Boston, where he continued to preach for the rest of his life. A major intellectual and public figure in English-speaking colonial America, he basically believed that Muslims did not exist in America. This perhaps being a relief for a British man who had much contact and exchange with Muslims as the British had been occupying Muslim lands for more than 200 years. Negative stereotypes of Muslims were reinforced by the British, after the 1857 Indian Rebellion, thought to have been instigated by Indian Muslims. Colonialism fueled the images and feelings about Muslims to the Americas. For example, British colonialism fueled Muslim anti-imperialism through the 1930s when the Pakistan movement called for a separate Muslim homeland. Likewise, the resistance of Muslims to convert to Christianity confounded many Christian missionaries, one of whom suggested that Muslims regard themselves as God's peculiar people and look with feelings of hatred and contempt upon all opposing religions. Apparently, the irony was lost on this missionary author. He went on to write that Mohammedans have much more courage than the Hindus are much less mild and gentle. 
and they constitute a difficult and hitherto a comparatively unfruitful field noted for intolerance, self-righteousness, and blind, unreasoning confidence in their own system. Muslim anti-colonist views combined with a resistance to convert to Christianity were factors that intertwined with others to form British and American perspectives of Islam that persist even today. Conversely, modern polemics toward Muslim, Muslims in America appear to be grounded in a consistently redefining American national identity in a mosaic nation with a penchant for cultural homogeneity where Islam is perceived to stand in contrast to the American way. We can find similar patterns of anti-Semitism historically, a bit different, but in terms of race and rejection of Jews and Judaism is evidence in much of early colonial America. The lynching of Leo, uh, Leo Frank, a 29-year-old Jewish factory worker who was accused of murdering a female co-worker in Atlanta. And the famous Henry Ford's International Jew. The world's foremost problem, the International Jew, reflected several widespread anti-Semitic prejudices. American anti-Semitism focused on the old European racism of Jews as the world's problem, and how the Jews are always conniving into being in control. They would, indeed, some take, someday take over. For Americans, the view of Islam, for many, was and is the historical stubbornness of Muslims, but recently the stark portrayal in the media of insecurity, violence, unfounded fear designated to attract large audiences. What is more is that Islamophobia in America, as many scholars have outlined and discussed in, the, in their work, especially the manner in which a nation's deterioration of trust in its democratic institutions leads to the disintegration of human rights. For example, Ghania Basiri noted that democratic processes such as courts, elections, and constitutions where everyone should have equal rights, be involved in the political process, do not forge a cohesive national identity. In that questions of belonging and loyalty of minorities, religious or otherwise, pose an internal threat to American ideals and social order. Similarly, the Unite the Right at the University of Virginia in 2017, on August 11th, when went white nationalists encircled counter protesters at the base of the statue of Thomas Jefferson, after marching through the University of Virginia campus with torches with their favorite slogan, the number one slogan, Jews will not replace us. Another overt ex example of Islamophobia is when Keith Ellison, a Muslim, uh, chose to be sworn into office using Thomas Jefferson's copy of the Quran. It was Congressman Virgil Goode who stated, if American citizens don't wake up and adopt the Virgil Goode position on immigration, there will be likely many more Muslims elected to office and demanding the use of the Quran. By the, by the way, there have been. Conflating immigration with Islam, Goody went on to state, I fear that in the next century, we'll have many more Muslims in the United States if we do not adopt the strict immigration policies that I believe are necessary to preserve the values and beliefs traditional to, to the United States of America. Ellison's response was very civil. He said, I'm not an immigrant, I'm an African-American. Concern for Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are com complicated. They're related, also unrelated, with roots in both European and colonial perspectives. Jews and Muslims are simultaneously allies, with, and at times, not at all. However, what is glaring and at times overlooked is the Orientalist racial thought. My own colonial history as a child of refugees from India to Pakistan reminds me of how colonial administrators differentiated who could be a full citizen in India, even though they were native population. Alongside the Jewish population in, in, in nations in, in Europe, Morocco, and Algeria, where Jews were set upon a seesaw in terms of their citizenship. Here, both Jew and Muslim can look to a historical snapshot of how policies divided and pro produced pseudo-scientific reports in order to justify clear categories such as white, non-white, native, Jew, Muslim, Arab. In the United States, especially where Jews and Muslims make up 2% of the population, these stereotypes have hardened such categories in terms of race, religion, and the other. Has, this has created sharper stereotypes and distinct policies and slogans regarding both groups. 
I want to say that one of the problems of looking at this anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is not just about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia from non-Jews and non-Muslims, but it's also how to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia with one another, right? So one of the things that when I witness is that there are highly Islamophobic um, Jewish communities and there are highly anti-Semitic Muslim communities. My book is about Muslims and anti-Semitism. And I want us just to pause for a second before I end to think about how um, the denial of, say, for example, the Holocaust in my community fed into the hatred and animosity toward Jews in the Muslim world, how Jews were seen as allies of the West, and Ethan and talked about this in terms of the colonial Jew, the new colonial force aligned with the Europeans, and later the Americans. Why are Jews so important to Europeans was the question that many Muslims and Arabs asked. Anti-Semitism in the Arab Muslim world also figures in political and social realities that have led to Holocaust denial, relativism, and have produced a selective reading of the history of the Jews that cast them as Zionists, which is not a polite wor word in many circles. Um, those who align with Israel as a political movement and as allies of colonialism. Colonial history has also been dismissed in many Western curricula, while the memory of colonialism in every Muslim country is still fresh in the 21st century. Today, many national borders in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East that were created by 20th century colonial forces are collapsing in the turmoil of war. Colonial memory, therefore, is still fresh and has nurtured a deep resentment in much of the Arab world that has now moved to the American frontiers. The question that I had asked and have asked alongside scholars like Omar Boom, Timoth Timothy Snyder, Michael Rothberg, and Sheha Ghani is how do we remember one another? And how does that moment of deep memory paralyze us in terms of our perception of one another? In other words, what is it that we remember about one another at the same moment, place, and scene that is so very different from one another? This is the moment of, if one could say, the Husserl, Edmund Husserl's moment, or epoche, a pause, a parenthetical pause, to reflect deeply on issues of anti-Semitism, anti Islamophobia, but also how we, Ethan, a Jew, I, a Muslim, can have a conversation without accepting one another's allegiances. So these identities are complicated, and to see either the Jew or Muslim as homogeneous allows the onlooker to create a space whereby these religious minorities in the US oscillates by being accepted and being rejected, othered and living in a way as W.E.B. Du Bois described it as a state of double consciousness. So how do we how do, how do, do this work together? My fight against anti-Semitism is more pronounced because I am Muslim. Perhaps my work in Islam is buried because I am seen as a Jewish ally in the fight against anti-Semitism. This is a tough line to walk. As I continue to do my work as a director, I continue to create programs that set up unlikely people in the same work. Working in a project like refurbishing a synagogue inside a mosque in, in the Bronx. Muslim yeshiva students working with Holocaust survivors. Jews and Muslims that can talk about freedom and injustice in Israel and Palestine training evangelical pastors with Jewish Muslim Catholic scholars, including Sunnis, Shias, Reform, and Orthodox. It is not that we can combat these two racisms altogether, but we must set examples inside and outside of academia of how there are possibilities of dialogue and deep education from both Jew and Muslim. It is unfortunate that educational centers and professors at universities have fallen into the traps of certain camps that do not allow for conversation and contested narratives to be heard. That is why I applaud the Gimes uh, program. We are for sure experiencing what some might call cancel culture, or as I like to call it, the danger zone of expression. I want to just end uh, here going back to my daughter. A few months ago, my daughter, who is older now, now a teenager, pestered me about why young Jews who have Israeli flags and Jewish stars in their TikTok profiles were being canceled. She asked me why so many people hate Jews in Israel. She said some were being canceled without saying a word and just for a symbol, a sign that represents Jewishness. 
My heart sank again like it did in 2017. I sat with her all night and told her that no matter where your politics and national allegiances lie, there is no reason to erase anybody. How will we be able to communicate the deep concerns that our teenagers have, or all of you have? All I can hope is that she will have an interesting time as a Muslim American woman who is already navigating the world of hatred prejudice, and she still seems to have good questions and has some hope for change, conversation, and difference. Thank you. Um, cool, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I, yeah, thanks, Ethan, for that question. I mean, I think that's an important question is about, you know, who can we count as allies? And I mean, I do mention that sometimes Jews and Muslims are amazing allies and sometimes they're not at all. So, I mean, one thing I want to um, mention to, especially the students here, because I think it's important for you to hear experiences. And when um, the Muslim ban was being kind of put out there, which you know is now a seven country ban, right? Um, there was a huge demonstration against it in New York City, where I live, and um, I took my daughter there, and the majority of people who were demonstrating against the Muslim ban were Jewish. And it was an incredible feeling for me and my Muslim community that went there with our kids to see that. And there were, uh, Jews who had signs that said, you know, if this ban goes through, we will put on the yellow star, uh, which was amazingly powerful. So I think that really, really helped. And actually, that's been referenced a lot, um, even recently, um, you know, in the last few years, like a couple years, um, there's, there's been a lot of referencing of how Jews were allies, and it's, it's an exam example, right? So like, when you have when you actually are acting, you're actually out there, you're doing something, people remember that. Um, and I think that's really important for us. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> I was like, don't <laughs> So, I mean, I have a lot of questions for you, Ethan, but I think one of the things that I want you to explain is what do you mean that Zionism is the na national liberation of the Jews? Movement of Jews, yeah. Um, so, what I mean is that Zionism was founded as a movement. I mean, I'm going to say something. There is a lot of ways in which Zionism was, and for some people it remains, in the Jewish lives of And what I mean by that is, Zionism was born in a context where people felt that they had tried to. Okay, um, can we keep going, Jonathan? What's, yeah, okay. 
So I mean, I, you know, I want to stay with this because I think it's really important. And I've, you know, done a series on Zionism. Um, I've also written about it, and I think it's it's a it's a really important topic in terms of looking at the history of Zionism, because today it's equated with Nazism, um, it's equated with oppression, it's equated with, um, you know, if you are a Zionist, you can't be part of this. If you so there's there's a certain, you know, real kind of social uh, perception of Zionism. I'm not talking about the history of it or the political or um, because it has Zionism is also many things to Jews as well, right? So I mean, can you expound? I mean, explain that to us in a way that we can understand it as a Jewish movement and not not connected to Palestine in any way. Well, I don't think Yeah, I mean, definitely it's part of my class. I mean, it's I, I'm teaching Muslims in America right now. We start with 
the history, you know, looking at slavery and looking at Muslims and what happened to Muslims and how there were some Muslims that actually convinced people that they were illiterate, they were literate and they, had, they escaped slavery or were taken back to Africa or West Africa. So it was really interesting how this history happened. And a lot of the Muslims that came here as slaves also converted because they didn't have a choice. The majority were Christians. And then some of them um, disappeared. And then you see again sort of a history of Muslims in the 1920s and 30s. So when we, we talk about Muslims, it, it is kind of like, oh, these new people. But it's not Muslims. I think it's the radical ignorance we have about Islam. Radical ignorance. I mean, it's unbelievable how we are <coughs> still struggling with this after 20 years of you know, 9-11 and all of that. So I mean, every, I, when I read you my evaluations, I was not lying to you. And these are, you know, 18-year-olds coming to my class. I mean, they don't even know 9-11, right? I mean, it's kind of in their mind, but they really don't know much about it. So one of the things that is really very challenging for Muslims is we have to recreate our identities constantly to be part of the fabric of America. I mean, I don't wear the hijab, but I know my friends who do that have a harder time um, but as soon as I say I'm Muslim, they're like, oh, then the, the questions come. And the questions are pretty much like, what are you doing here? Um, so these, and they're very hurtful moments. I mean, I was just telling you about my daughter. Hopefully it will strengthen her and not weaken her. fundamental and they've been fundamental for many Christians who have led various fights against exclusionary isms uh, and so um, it, to the extent that if we look at the country that I uh, know best probably France there were very important churches that were uh, sites for Muslim immigrants other uh, immigrants without papers in the 1970s to take refuge uh, places where um, you know, the church, they tried to say they weren't making a political statement, they were making a humanitarian statement, and these people should not be expelled from the country because they lack proper papers. Uh, and so I think that that basic injunction of caring for uh, your neighbor and caring for, for the weakest um, has uh, animated a lot of important Christian efforts uh, to help Muslims and Jews in very specific contexts. Of course, we know very well uh, about the work of uh, very important uh, Catholic and Protestant theologians during the Second World War as well to you know, obligate uh, their congregants to help Jews. We know of extraordinary stories 
um, like in uh, Chaumont in France, where uh, basically all of the Jews were saved um, by the, the local uh, Protestant community. And um, my colleague, Robert Braun, uh, has done an amazing study where he shows, and I think it's quite pertinent to our conversation tonight, that during the Holocaust, across a huge number of communities and countries in Europe, those who were most likely to protect Jews were Protestant minorities in Catholic majority areas and Catholic minorities in Protestant majority areas. Right? Uh, in some manner, they had some understanding of what it meant to be a minority. Um, and I think, and I'll end uh, here, that's important also for the way Muslims and Jews can and should think about each other. There's a very deep tradition of understanding the position of the stranger and notions about hospitality uh, and welcoming the foreigner and the other in both Judaism and Islam, sometimes in the same uh, stories and, and texts. Uh, and we see, you know, I've seen in my own work how uh, there were Jews, for instance, during the era of the anti-colonial wars in Algeria who were really animated by a sense of obligation coming from this notion Jews were once strangers in a strange land uh, and have an obligation to the stranger. And I, so I think actually when Judaism and Islam look to those parts of their traditions, we're exceptionally well equipped combining that theological perspective with the afterlives of it through many of our own experiences in each of our communities to have a, a visceral way of relating to the discrimination and oppression that those in the other community face. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a very, comp I mean, I am a religious study, so it's very complicated for me, but at the same time, I mean, I'll, I'll respond, I'll, I know quite a bit about, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and, you know, the whole, in terms of the Holocaust and the Catholic churches, but in terms of Islam, I would say that from a theological perspective, I think that there is a very positive outlook um, in terms of Christianity, um, in terms of religion, but it's also, you know, mired by, I think, the experience of missionary um, experience all over, especially Africa and Asia. Um, so I think there is this kind of very weird dialectical relationship. Yes, we accept this. Jesus is beloved to us. I mean, on a very simple framework, you know, we're talking about the public, the community, but there's also this rejectionism because there is this idea that somehow this Christianizing mission that went went hand in hand with colonization became a problem and an obstacle for people to become themselves. Um, for example, you know, just my mother had to go to Catholic school because she didn't really have a choice. Um, and so she would come home and, pr and do the Salat at home, but she was attending a Catholic school, and that was sort of like syncretic, right? Like there was a blending of these, these religions, but then there was this sort of realization unconsciously that one religion was really colonizing another religion in, in, in terms of salvation. So I think that became sort of bitter um, and, and kind of Muslim, Muslims all over, um, including Arabs, were rejecting that. Um, constantly as a part of a process of, of civilization again. So I think Christianity, you know, because, you know, the colonists use Christianity, I mean, we can even talk about the Crusaders, right? Um, not to say Muslims were always great and innocent, but there was this sort of idea of conversion um, that was really part of the process of civilizing and to sort of do God's work. Um, in one's hand. And I think that became very problematic for a lot of Muslims um, in terms of their response. And I mean, in terms of Jews, I mean, the Jews were also sort of had the same, you know, like, it's like Martin Luther was so excited because he thought he could convert the Jews, and then the Jews would not convert. And he said, oh my God. And he became even worse of an anti-Semite. So there was this sort of like constant, constant, you know, kind of wanting this conversion or, you know, to be fair, to save, right, from the perspective of what salvation means in Christianity. And this is really important work in terms of interfaith dialogue. Because when you sit with Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and when, when you start to realize that Muslims and Jews don't really believe in the crucifixion of Christ or 
salvation, then you're like, okay, well, what are we going to talk about, right? I mean, this is like the cross, crux of what Christians believe. And what, I mean, I'm at a Catholic school, and I talk about that, and my, my Catholic, the brothers are like, what? What did she just say? And I'm like, yes, we, we don't believe that, you know? It doesn't mean we can't have a conversation. But I think that is such the, the, process, the idea of salvation and civilizing became this sort of uh, homogeneous imaging all over, uh, especially Asia and Africa, that, that is a problematic thing theologically for Muslims. Right, and I mean, oh. well, I just wanted to add on, on the points that Manaz was making. I mean, no, I'm not allowed to. Thank you. I'm sorry. I understand. I understand. I apologize. Hi, I'm John Kaltner from the Religious Studies Department. Thank you for your comments and conversation. Uh, I teach courses in the Bible with a particular focus on uh, the relationship with the Quran and Islam, and also a course on Islamophobia. And uh, my question is really more of a request, I guess, a practical one. Uh, could you each recommend a resource or two that would be helpful for someone, perhaps uh, some of our students who are interested in getting a sense of how one goes about combating uh, Islamophobia or anti-Semitism? It might be a website, an organization, a particular individual, a book, or, or something along those lines. I mean, I'll start with some shameless self-promotion. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, Jonathan mentioned our initiative, the Anti-Semitism Education Initiative at Berkeley. We, as he mentioned, made an 11-minute anti-bias training film about anti-Semitism, uh, which packs a lot in. Uh, if your students only have 11 minutes, uh, I think it's a great start. And we also have discussion questions for leading a longer session around it. Um, and, and we, on that, on that page, if you go to the, if you Google Anti-Semitism Education Berkeley, um, we have also usually four to six programs a year, which we then archive as podcasts. So we have a lot of resources there for all kinds of questions about, you know, cyber hate, uh, blacks and Jews, um, all kinds of important topics. Um, so I think that that's, uh, you know, a good place to start uh, for anti-Semitism. I'm going to let Manaz make a better recommendation than I would for Islamophobia. Oh, God, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's actually t tons of um, material. So Omed Safi, as you probably know him, he's a writer. Um, Sadia Sheikh, there is uh, uh, Ghani Basari, there's tons and tons of writers. Um, I mean, my, my book is really about anti-Semitism in the Muslim community. It could be useful, and it's been taught in, in college uh, classes. You can pick that. It's also a journey, so it's something useful to look at both. And also, I speak about Islamophobia in that book. But really, I mean, one of the things I would really, really encourage for you to do is do not look at uh, Islamic organizations, but look at non-profit Muslim organizations. So there is like the Islamic network groups um, that comes out of San, San Francisco. It's fabulous. It gives you all kinds of inform information on what's going on with Muslims. Um, it does, there's a lot of conversation about anti-Semitism. And the reason I say that is because I do the same with also Jewish organizations. I look at really nonprofit, and I, I and it's because they're grassroots movements and they're funded differently. Um, I run a center, so I know how funds work, and I think it's really important to look at the right information. It's really hard to get really good information, and I always say this to my students. You know, you guys have this wonderful tool that I wish I had when I was much younger. And, um, but I don't know if you know how to use it. And so I think that's so important that you talk to your mentors um, and people in this field, but also when you find something, you know, send it to a professor or someone you know who's Muslim or Jewish and say, hey, what do you think of this? I think that's so important for younger people today, um, really essential. So non-profit organizations are the way to go. So thank you all so much. Oh, it is loud. Uh, I'm Sarah Ifstecker, uh, coming from the History Department, as well as, of course, the Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies program. And I'm a medieval historian. And uh, I teach a number of courses that, that focus on presenting a multi-religious medieval past. 
And that's, uh, to some extent, the root of my question as well. Uh, of course, you both touched on uh, the long history of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and, and, the link, and on the link between the two. It's, in fact, of course, even older. A uh, clear example is the Crusades, which, of course, obviously linked with Islamophobia, but also tied to attacks on Jewish communities as well. Uh, and so my question is, uh, what role do you think history has to play, and in particular, uh, educating people on a deep history at a time when even education on the Holocaust is in decline? Uh, what role do we have in terms of you know, bringing in a more distant past as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a historian, um, but I pretend to be. <laughs> Because I think it's cool and like at least where I where I hang out. Anyway, um, <laughs> we welcome so, you. <laughs> okay. <thank> you. <laughs> um, I think I think history is extremely important, but I think relevancy is as important, especially when you're teaching right history. And you know the word medieval scares people. Of it. <laughs> and it's a very I mean it's scary time, but it's also a cool time, right? In certain empires and what you look at. In terms of Islam, it's a very progressive, even Judaism, you know, like, so you can sort of look at it as a multivalent time, but it's, I think relevancy is very, very important. And this is why I think we need to break fields open to how perhaps medieval time has to do with, say, you know, what's going on in the Islamic world today. Um, there has to be sort of a point to the contemporary compass. I mean, Ethan mentions intersectionality, and I think there's a problem with that word, but there's also something important about that word, right? So how do we make this relevant? I mean, what was race like in the medieval times, right? Um, so why were Muslims taxing Jews and Christians, the Jizya tax? And you know, what did, what did that do? Was that making them more safe, or was it for them paying to live amongst the other? So these are really, different ways of looking at how history functions today. Yeah, um, I'll just say a couple things. I mean, one thing that I think is really important is I say more and more about anti-Semitism, and I think it's true about whether we want to call Islamophobia or anti-Muslim uh, hatred, um, that it's really baked into Western civilization. It's really embedded in the Western tradition, right? I mean, we use the, the term of um, disease sometimes, but I, I like a term that, our, that I heard our colleague uh, David Feldman uh, use on a panel that Jonathan was also on, uh, of a reservoir. That it's always there. Uh, and for many people, they grew up in contexts where they learned a lot of these tropes in a passing way. And maybe they weren't activated for them ever, but it won't take that much for them to be activated for a significant number of people, because they're always there some kind of lower, you know, on a low simmer. So I think that people understanding how deeply embedded these things are, just like we are spending a lot of time, very importantly, talking about how deeply embedded anti-black racism is in the United States and, and often in Western civilization, we need to also realize that that's, that's very true about anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred. Um, and I also want to just say that I think people can't really understand the degree of sensitivity that is being pushed in both Jewish and uh, Islamic communities today without looking at certain signal moments that are forever ingrained historically, right? So I talk about how after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is never the same. People never think about small slights uh, of Jews the same way because they look at a history of a buildup to something no one ever imagined possible. And so people respond and sometimes overreact, I would say, uh, to small things. Um, in the Muslim context, I think people don't understand the ways in which the Crusades were then seen as the template for modern European colonialism. And so all kinds of Western encroachment that might be beneficent, that might not mean to be about a takeover, uh, are viewed with tremendous suspicion. That's true in terms of in cultural terms as well. Um, you know, George W. Bush, right after 9-11, he spoke about going on a crusade quickly told by some advisors to stop saying that. Uh, um, but, but because it, it resonated so deeply in such a negative way, because it's so deeply in uh, Islamic historical consciousness. Can I just say one more thing? I know you want to start. But I mean, I just want to. likes you better than I, just, I, 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 do, 
I really want to mention Ukraine um, only because I want the students in this audience to think about what do you really know about Ukraine except for what you're seeing right now. The history of what's going on right now is so important. Um, and, you know, as somebody who teaches genocide and the Holocaust, you've got to know your history to understand the outbreak of what goes on in different places uh, all over the world. Um, in Bosnia, um, you know, in 1995, was a repercussion of 1,454. Just think of that for a second. So those are really important moments, and these are teaching moments for us to sort of say, look, look at what's going on. So, Dr. Afridi, I, I, I also think like that's a really great point to underline Professor Kaltner's question, which is that like the best resources are right here, housed in the context of classes that you can take from Jaime's faculty. If you want to know more about Islamophobia, take Dr. Kaltner's course on Islamophobia. If you want to know more about anti-Semitism, take my course on anti-Semitism or take a course I teach on race and racism, which explores the interconnections between anti-black, anti-Jewish, and anti-Muslim racism. Like the deepest way you can dive into this stuff is to spend a semester or five semesters studying it in the context of getting a Jimes uh, minor. Don't, don't go off, because there's no joke there. Um, so the mics are gonna now be passed around only to students to ask questions with the remainder of the time that we have left. Um, Isabella and Brittany will uh, take the mics around. Uh, raise your hand if you get a question in. We've got some pretty cool Communities in Conversation t-shirts, so that's an extra vibe to make you brave with the time that we have left, okay? Um, my name is Emil. I have a, I have a something to add to what Dr. Min has said, the first question. But how do you, from a political point of view, how do you justify what's happening in Palestine as not Zionism? How do I justify that? I don't think I'm, I, I don't think there's a, there is a justification. I think what is happening in what is happening right now in Israel is that there is the national movement of Zionism that created people and uh, to move to Jews to move to Palestine and Israel today um, I don't think there's a justification I think that the justification question begs what Zionism is itself so can you, you want to elaborate what you mean not justify, maybe explain a little bit more. Explain the Zionism that's, okay, well, I mean, one of the things about Judaism, Jews is that it is also one of the most important places for Jews to be in, which is Palestine. Um, so the movement to, to Palestine, not just in the 1940s or 1930s, but starting in, in huge ways in the 1870s, was to escape from basically anti-Semitism. And majority of the people that were going into what is Israel and Palestine today were people who were escaping from Europe, especially Eastern Europe. So you have this move that comes in. Actually, one of the most important things to understand is how the Arabs that were there in Palestine, including Jews and Christians, um, so there were Jews also in Palestine living with Arabs, and that's something I think that is misunderstood a lot, were perceiving the migration and the large migrations of Jews as European settlers. So one of the ways that Zionism has seen is through the lens of the colonial um, European settler. But Zionism itself started in the 1870s as a move to help Jews escape situations all over Europe. And then you think it take Well, I mean, yeah, I, th I think that that's already really helpful, and it's really important, the point you made about the fact, I mean, there were Jews in 
whether we want to call it the land of Israel or Palestine, for all of the centuries from the time of the, uh, you know, Roman expulsion, there were still, you know, at the time when the return, uh, so to speak, began in the 19th century, there were 25,000 or so Jews living in Palestine as part of a contiguous community. So I, right, exactly. So I think that's important. Um, it's also, I, I think, important to point out that, you know, this was, Zionism was also a move to reclaim an ancient language. Hebrew it was a total revival of the Hebrew language and reinvention of the Hebrew language. It had a lot in common in many respects with the anti-colonial movements that would flourish a couple of generations later in terms of reclaiming the heritage of a subaltern minority that, that had been, many people would use the language of colonized within Europe. Um, and obviously, it then went about that in a political way uh, that displaced uh, Palestinians more and more uh, from the early 20th century uh, through the mid-20th century. I also do think it's important to point out today Israel is about 50% Jews from or descended from Jews who came from Arab lands. Uh, and in 19, you know, beginning in 1948, there was a very large um, migration, uh, you know, often forced migration uh, of Jews from those lands to Israel. Uh, so it's also very complicated to think about the relationship of those Jews to uh, colonial status. They were often treated poorly by European Zionists for decades uh, in Israel uh, and had, of course, been forced to flee their native countries to which um, most of them could never return. Um, hi, my name is Anna Grace, uh, class of 25. I just had a question, um, uh, you know, expanding more on the conversation surrounding Zionism. So it's kind of like a two-part question. Um, one is that you mentioned um, uh, the Jewish people having a whole range of ideas, beliefs, and goals related to Zionism and what those mean for different people and how it's not like one set idea, so I was wondering maybe you could expand on that. And also, if you agree with the idea that Zionism isn't like these black and white notions of, you know, very, very, very like, you know, uh, essentialist ideas of like reclaiming the Holy Land, expelling those who don't belong in the Holy Land, you know, these very like essentialist and often uh, uh, what's the word of like you know violent ideas and it rather exists on this sort of spectrum that covers a lot of different ideas uh, good very good question um, I mean so so I mean first of all yes Zionism uh, I think it was Manas who, who said very importantly Zionism uh, was and is many things um, in the early decades uh, of Zionism there were big debates about whether Zionism should even be a political movement there were people who talked about it more as a cultural movement, as a movement to reclaim and revive Jewish culture, to, re to revive a sense of Jewish national culture, but not necessarily uh, with political sovereignty. Um, yeah, re right, right. Then, right. Then religious Zionism, which religious Zionism is, is, a, is a complicated story because traditionally Jews were not supposed to return en masse to the land of Israel until the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and so religious Zionists had to sort of you know, they, they had to look to kind of different texts and different traditions to think about sort of that Jews returning would then, you know, bring uh, the Messianic age in time. This is sort of the argument of uh, religious Zionism. But I mean, yes, I think it's really important that Zionism not be understood as black and white. I mean, the reality is that while there were discussions about things like transfer of uh, Arabs from Palestine as early as the 1930s. There also were a series of moments where Zionist leaders embraced compromise plans that would have created a Jewish and an Arab homeland, uh, both side by side in Palestine, most notably uh, in 1947 uh, when they supported the partition plan of the United Nations. Um, and you know, I, I think we'd all be better off if everyone had embraced that plan because there, then there'd be a Palestinian state today. Um, so, you know, it, but, but I think it's also important to recognize, and here I would, would encourage everybody to read uh, Ari Shavit's book, My Promised Land, because I think he gets at this really well. I mean, there's ways in which, in order for Zionism to be successful, a certain amount of violence was arguably 
necessary, even if Zionism had taken a different path and there had been more compromises over time in the sense that there was a, a significant amount of displacement that kind of had to occur probably for the building of a state. And that's a, that's a really important thing I think for Zionists to grapple with. Um, and it does speak to some degree to the level of urgency that Zionists felt in the sense that um, you know, anti-Semitism in Europe was rising and many of them felt that the, the future of the Jewish people was on the line. Um, but it also meant some really difficult history uh, of displacement and violence toward Palestinians. Uh, and so struggling with that duality, I think is really important to being real about the history of Zionism from multiple perspectives. Can, I, I also want to say that, you know, um, <clears throat> that Israel and Palestine are not the only place in the world. Um, and I mean that really seriously. Uh, and, and, you know, I was just thinking of a wonderful exhibit in Venice at the Biennale last year done by a Muslim Indian young woman. And it's called, uh, it was called uh, A Knife Through the Kitchen. And it really was about the partition between India and Pakistan and how literally lines were drawn through kitchens and what a bloody kind of massacre it was. Two million people died uh, during the partition. But then I also think of Kashmir, and I think of Chechnya, and I think of, uh, you know, even uh, the Uyghur Muslims that have wanted their independence from China. And I think of, you know, Myanmar, and I think of so many, uh, and I think of Sudan, and I remember um, thinking about so many Muslim countries that are under severe war, Syria. And I ask my Muslim brothers and sisters, where are you? Why is Israel and Palestine the end of the world? This is a very important question for all of us to ask, Jews and Muslims together. So as somebody who really does deal with genocide, there are a lot of problem areas in the world. That is a very depressing, uh, but nonetheless, very appropriate um, final set of comments. I want to be respectful to everybody's time because I know all of you have complicated lives and complicated schedules, and thank you so much uh, for sticking through this conversation. It really was deep and rich, and our hope is that one or two or three things were said tonight that were really new things for you to hear to make you perhaps think again about things that are circulating in the cultural ether out there. And I just want to repeat one more time that like there are worlds to discover here. And even though a lot of the focus tonight is about the negative associations directed towards Muslims and directed towards Jews and the way those ended up resulting in certain kinds of practices and in some cases violence and sometimes math, mass death and genocide, to bring it back to Dr. Afridi's point, there are also living worlds of extraordinary richness and depth and insight that are part of Jews and Muslims inter interacting oftentimes with Christians that you will discover in a deeper way if you take courses in Jimes that allow you to dig into that stuff. If Israel-Palestine is what you want to uh, get into, take Dr. Tarim's course. She and I are also planning a course together on Zionism and its critics that will happen in spring of 2023, but there's a plethora of other worlds to discover. So thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Thanks m most of all to Dr. Friedi and Dr. Katz for leading us through this. I'm sure that they would also be happy to take any individual questions that you have afterwards.